Thank you, thank you, everybody. It is showtime. Uh, but uh, we are thrilled uh, to have Ray Dalio here uh, and the former Treasury Secretary. It really is a privilege for us uh, to spend the next half hour together uh, really trying to understand where the economy is right now, not just here in the United States, uh, but globally. And that's where I want to start the conversation, which is this. Uh, the last two conversations that have taken place on this stage this morning thus far, uh, invariably the, the question I think underlying both of those conversations is what is a realistic economic growth rate here in the United States? We can talk about the rest of the world in just a moment, but I just wanted to start there. I, I know you think, both of you think about this uh, issue pretty much all day, every day. What, what do you think is a real number for us, uh, for us to base well, all of these investments upon? Um, I'll give you a number that's, uh, you know, about one and a half to two percent, something probably closer to one and a half to two percent. Um, but I think that the answer to the question is really why. We are, there's only so much you can squeeze out of a debt cycle, and we're there globally. So when you can't lower interest rates anymore, we know that the power of having the effect on asset prices going up because interest rates go down. In other words, they has a present value effect that causes interest rates to lower interest rates cause asset prices. We're reaching that limit. The inability to produce stimulation by lowering interest rates that makes debt service payments lower and causes spending is at a limit. The wealth gap uh, is part of that limit. So you can't lower interest rates more materially. Maybe they go the other way. And you also are at a limited quantitative easing because the spreads are limited. In other words, the way quantitative easing works is that somebody comes in and buys an asset, the central bank, they buy a bond, they sell that bond, they want to buy something else, causes all the assets to go up. So globally, those forces that we're behind are no longer behind us. This is a, so the real question I think that people should think of is are we at the end of a long-term debt cycle? I think that Japan is one step ahead of Europe and Europe is one step or two steps ahead of the United States and the United States is probably two steps ahead of China in terms of a limited ability to produce stimulation to produce that kind of growth. So everybody will have a, a lower growth rate than we're used to. Tim, do you have any, any more optimistic view on what that number could ultimately be? I think when I uh, left the New York Fed like ages ago, it feels like decades ago, I think the Fed economists then thought the U.S. economy was a two and a quarter percent potential growth economy, long-term potential growth. And I would say most economists today are, uh, are in raised range. Um, you, you have to recognize that uh, demographics and slower productivity growth are just big, powerful secular trends, apart from the, the things Ray was focusing on, too. Um, and that just brings a lot of gravity to what's possible in these economies. It's, a, it's like a world where um, people, you know, people say it's a world of diminished expectations, slow growth, uh, low return. I think the scarier things are really about, uh, about politics, about the scary erosion of, of the pragmatic center in politics diminished capacity to make sensible economic choices on things governments really have to do, uh, and the erosion in the Keynesian arsenal, or the erosion in the policy tools available to help offset the effects of um, a next recession, a modest shock. Those two things are very consequential, very damaging, very scary things. If all we faced was a world where demographics uh, were going to produce somewhat slower growth, but it was more stable, durable, that would be fine. Uh, but those two other things make right. it a little bit more perilous. You, you brought up politics, so I'll just ask this question. Donald Trump has said that 4% is attainable. Blue sky it with me, given the numbers that you just presented. What would you have to do, or what could you do from a policy perspective to get there? You know, I don't, I think that, um, I think people have this sense that our system can't deliver anything meaningful. 
But you know, if you want to take a more hopeful view of the world, we're operating so far of the, short of the frontier of what's possible in terms of sensible policy that you know, it, it's possible you could, if you had a little bit better, we rediscovered the capacity for more pragmatic uh, government, you could see some improvement in both the rate at which we grow over time and, and how those outcomes are distributed. But it's hard to overcome those deeper uh, secular forces in the consequences of coming out of a long-term debt cycle and the uh, secular pressures on demographics. So you, you can be optimistic that you know, by getting closer to the frontier, what we know would work, you could get better outcomes, but they're, they're not going to dramatically increase the rate at which we can grow over long periods of time. Yeah, I think that there are two forces, basically, that you have to think about as productivity or debt and money cycles. So you're either going to get it because you make some big changes in productivity, and we could play around with how that might exist, uh, but you're not going to have the debt cycles. You're going to have a big money cycle. The money cycle is really a question then for investors who are holding money. In other words, the central banks necessarily have to make it uh, really bad for savers. Which, which they're doing. Which they're doing. Very well. <laughs> in order to make it better for debtors. And so we are in a situation where um, everybody, they want to drive you out of cash. They want to drive you out of bonds. And by making them so terrible. We have experienced um, not the bad returns of that yet because investors uh, look at the price move as well as the carry. And we go through these cycles where um, the carry gets all the attention right. and then you're squ squeezing a little bit of carry out of it and if the price is not against you. That's a dangerous situation because the carry can be disappeared in a price move of a day. And when that starts to happen, um, we have a risk that... Uh, but what's the tipping point for that? And then how do you, if you're an investor in this audience or elsewhere, position yourself for that, recognizing that we've been talking about this particular issue for now many years? Well, I think if, if, you, if you extrapolate, do pro forma financial statements for five years forward and start to look at what that would mean in terms of um, monetary policy and also what it means for cash flows. So um, if you take the ECB's policy and you say that you, that has to go on for five years, as you start to get even months into it, they can't buy the same stuff. They have to then continue to buy different things. Now start to think of the implications of that. Or take Japan and you think, well, what can they buy and what can they do? You, they're starting to buy things that are going to be riskier assets in this greater monetization. I think that as a result of that, um, um, investors, holders of assets, particularly financial assets, will start to think about alternatives. And those alternatives, uh, when that happens, will probably have uh, uh, you know, a profound effect on the nature of the market action. In other words, kind of the end to the cycle that we've been through. You said to me when we were talking backstage, and I hope I can... It, that the historical parallel is 1935 to 1945. That's where we are now? Yeah, well, it, you want to find an analogous period to, that you look to, but um, the 19, the 1929 uh, period was a uh, bubble, just like t 2008. And we had a classic, uh, tiny monetary policy, we had a classic depression, 1930 right. to, uh, 1929 to 1932. From then, you had the monetization, quantitative easing, essentially the monetization, producing of money to make up that gap, and you had the reactions after that. Then you bring interest rates down to close to zero. So now we have a situation that's, um, where there's no interest rates hardly, and that asset prices um, have enjoyed the uh, liquidity effect. And so there is no period in time, it would be the most recent period in time globally that is most analogous to the situation we're in. Right. I want to get to the Fed, but I just have one policy question for you, a bank policy question. We talked about Wells Fargo and other things this morning here. When you think about all of the regulations that have been placed on top of the financial system, Wall Street capital requirements, leverage ratios, what do you think that's done to the growth rate? I think the financial system, by, by most measures, is dramatically more stable today because the strength of the capital cushions in the system are just dramatically thicker. And 
that's a valuable investment in trying to reduce the risks of you know, further trauma from the system. And I think, it's, I think it's, although there's a lot of muck and bad design in the regulation that came after the crisis, you know, the pendulum tends to kind of, I don't know how to describe it, but yeah, it's a messy muck of stuff. Uh, but I think it's hard to make the argument, even if it would be nice to clean that up and make it a little bit more intelligent design in some ways, I think it's hard to make the argument outside some important pockets of the economy that it's had a meaningful negative effect on how fast we're growing. Again, if, I think if you're, if one of the great strengths of us is, if, you know, if, you're, if you're a company in the United States today, you've got an idea, uh, it's, it's just a great place to try to raise capital. And uh, the diversity of ways people can finance things in this place is a, is a great strength. That, that, I think, is better today than it was. There are some exceptions, though. I mean, if you're, um, if you're self-employed and relatively moderate income, it's much harder to get a mortgage. And uh, that has some effect. And if you're a small businesses in some areas, it, it's, it's tough uh, post, post-crisis to... But I don't think that's principally the, the result of, um, of the undesirable features right. of some of the reforms. Some of it's in there, but not, it's not the dramatic piece. Ray, I want to talk Fed with you. Um, this, is, this is Mr. Volcker. He says that you have, quote, a bigger staff and produce more relevant statistics than the Federal Reserve does. <laughs> So what is it that you know that the Fed might be missing? Um, In my humble opinion, I think that the Fed is putting too much emphasis on the business cycle and not enough on the long-term debt cycle. And I don't think they may be paying enough attention to how markets react relative to what's discounted in the curve. So we have about 50 basis points of tightening over the next three years priced into the curve. That affects all asset prices because all asset prices are affected by interest rates. It's the discount rate for the present value of the future cash flows. So if there's a change in those interest rates relative to discount, not only does that affect the bond market, it affects the equity market. That has a wealth effect. I don't know, and I'm going to say they don't know, I think the Fed has different views And some people have different views, so I wouldn't want to characterize it as a whole. But I also think they're paying attention to some of those things. But it's a risky thing to discount, to raise interest rates more than is discounted in the curve, particularly the duration of assets has lengthened. As interest rates goes down, there's a mechanical... So so when Jamie Dimon says to raise interest rates, you think that's wrong? That's right. I think that that's wrong. At this stage, the risks are so asymmetric. Like, there's no doubt that you can uh, slow the economy, the world economy, the U.S. economy. Tightening will work, okay? And when you look at the inflation pressures, you know, uh, this is a global thing. And you look at the demographics, um, all of those things means that the risks are so much more on the downside. If you have a downturn, like Tim is saying, if you have a downturn and you don't have that power, We've never been in a world together that has been like this, you know? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a dramatically different world. We all get used to the a world before the crisis where modest shock was met with massive capacity to ease. Recessions became, you know, shorter and shallower, more contained. Uh, I don't think there's any precedent for the world today where, you know, we, we're, we're an expansion that's pretty old. It doesn't look that old, but it's old in years. And, you know, we're in a world where stuff, bad things happen. But, just, but the danger ended. is that we are out of ammo at this point, And that if you don't raise we're rates, not, you're not really out of ammo. You're not, but the idea that you should raise rates to replenish the arsenal is a, and slow the economy, that's a, that's a weird argument to make. I think that it's, not, it's, not, it's true to say that uh, central banks and developed markets are much closer to the frontier of what's possible than I think any of us ever, have ever seen. But it's, it's, not, it's not true, and I think Ray would say, it's not true that uh, the major governments are completely out of ammunition. Certainly the United States, certainly China, uh, certainly parts of Europe have a range of things they could do. But still, in aggregate, they are less, and it's a weaker arsenal, okay. weaker thing than was, what, what was available the- to us in, in, in almost any previous period that any of us have seen or read about. What about the 1935 was the year that the term met pushing on a string was invented. Um, we are 
on varying degrees closer to pushing on a string. Japan is pushing on a string. Europe is quite close to pushing on a string. Um, the United States is closer to pushing on a string. China is a little bit farther away. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, and I think there are, there are some slightly offsetting things which are good, which is that because the financial system uh, has more capital, it's less likely to amplify a negative shock. And a given dose of monetary policy, fiscal policy, is, will have more power than in a system that is weaker and more fragile. That's a good offsetting thing. Also, it's also true that the, you know, the basic framework of many emerging markets is a much more resilient, less fragile than it was before. That's tr good, too, in some sense. But still, the fact that for most of the major developed economies, governments and centers are so close to the frontier of what they can do is a, uh, is a dangerous and scary thing. Okay, but, but here's the policy question. Isn't there an argument to be made that by keeping interest rates as low as they have been, they have effectively allowed Congress to not do its job? That by, by forcing the issue, you would force you, you would force real measures to take place that actually might improve the economy on a more long-term basis. You mean because you'll inflict more pain? I mean, how does that forcing happen? Because it effectively becomes a prod. If, 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 the, gov if the government, is, if, if, if the Fed is going to have uh, low interest rates and take on the employment uh, issue as its, as, as its job, any senator and congressperson doesn't have to. I'll leave the politics to Tim. I don't, I don't do politics. Uh, <laughs> but I, but I, I think that, to be fair, I think if you ask the members of Congress what stands in the way of them finding some way to legislate things that be good for the economy, they wouldn't say uh, the Fed's doing so much we feel no need to do anything. Their problem is they can't agree on things that make sense. They're just too far apart. The, the center is eroded. On, on that topic, though, do you think it's worse than it was when you left Washington? <laughs> you know, I don't know. When I, uh, when I was in my, that, that job, people used to come see me uh, and say, uh, gee, it seems hard. Politics are terrible. And I'd say, uh, it, it's so much worse than you think. <laughs> I think today, uh, I, I kind of want to think it's better than it looks. Uh, I'd like to think that as an American, you know, I'd like to be optimistic. <laughs> I'd like to think it's a little better. Can't be quite as bad as, as it looks. You know, there are, you know, principled, uh, good, smart, capable people there who would like, who would really like to rediscover the capacity uh, to do things. And maybe, um, you know, we're a very strong, resilient country. We'll, we'll figure our way to that point again. And so I, I'm hoping that it's, it's better than it looks. Right. Um, to the extent that Brexit has a global impact, and let's see if it does, I'm curious what you think its implications are politically, not just for the UK, but for Europe, for China, by the way, for our own politics, if you think that it matters. Do you think about these things, not just from a market perspective, but from a sort of political policy perspective? Yeah. Um, again, I think that uh, populism, uh, the wealth gap, the uh, middle um, class, uh, all of that, um, the nationalism, the impatience, uh, is a global phenomenon. And again, it's very similar to like the late 30s, um, and that concerns me, yeah. And then, but, and then as an investor, what do you do about it? We, well, that's a complicated question, right? I mean, you, you diversify, you, I mean, you, have, you have a whole bunch of uncorrelated diversified bets, and um, then you also you know, understand it uh, as best you can. Uh, but, but you look at Europe and you say uh, the European Union won't be the European Union a decade from now as a function of what just took place? That, that, that's a time frame that I, you know, is beyond me. I, I, um, I couldn't answer that question. I, you know, you just try to stay six months or six days ahead of what's happening, you know? Were, were you, were you, I mean, there's always issues, like there's the Italian referendum, and there's this, and there's always a drama, and that's what makes the game so great, you know? Like, like um, uh, who knows? Do you have a view on this? You've watched this? I think this. that, I, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to, hard to see what they end up negotiating uh, in the wake of the referendum. Are you surprised some, that the numbers have but, not been as bad as we thought? Well, I, don't, I think it's hard to judge the impact now, but I think, the, I think for Europe, the question is, does the, 
dynamics and the fear associated, the risk associated with Brexit and what's happening in the politics of the continent, does that uh, induce uh, a bit more action by the governments of Europe, things that would help uh, hold it together? Meaning, does the fear of the more negative outcome that Brexit helps frame, does that induce uh, a little bit better policy? And, and does it help them take some, take less risks? Uh, and I think that would be a good positive thing, but you know, who knows, it's very hard to tell whether that's, that's gonna happen. But I think the significance of Brexit will, will, depend, will, will depend mostly not on what happens in the UK and really not mostly on what happens to the outcomes they ultimately negotiate, but what does it do to the incentive of the governing parties in Europe to try to do the things they need to do still to try to make the economy more better and to try to make the whole European Union more viable. Are you a long-term bull? A, a bull? bull. How could no. you be a bull? No, <laughs> I don't. I think I would just say that a, a bull that the that the European Union is still the European Union in any meaningful time frame from now. I, I still, yeah, I would say that's a probable outcome. Just you know, I watched them as they were looking in the abyss uh, over and over again in that period after our, our crisis, and um, each time they chose, they sort of looked at the alternative and said, "Looks terrible." Uh, let's see if we can keep it together. And I, I suspect that judgment will prevail. Right. Um, as we're flying around the globe, real quick, China. Both of you have expressed uh, concerns about China over the years. Where are you now on China? Uh, uh, there are short-term concerns, such like business cycle concerns, four of them. And then um, I just want to say that the leadership in, in China is much more capable than uh, is imagined. So, okay, here are the four concerns. They have to go through a debt restructuring. They have to go through an economic restructuring. They have to restructure their capital markets. And they have uh, to keep an eye on the balance of payments. Those are four risks. Those are things that we've all had to do. The United States has essentially had four major debt crises, you know, we couldn't pay our debts in 1971. I won't rattle them right. all off. We've restructured our economy in lots of ways. I remember when we were sad that the steel industry went and then we made those adjustments. Um, in terms of balance payments issues, there are all of those issues. The important thing is how they're dealing with it. And um, if you really you know, get to know the, um, the economic leaders and, and understand something of their uh, capabilities, which Tim has done, of course, very well, and I have done some too, um, you'd have to say they're highly capable people. And if you look at the programs that they've put together, my God, I could give you a list of the programs. It's so incredibly impressive that what, what they've put together. So this is manageable. This is a debt which is not in a foreign currency. I mean, the key thing is if you got a debt in a foreign currency, you're in deep trouble. If you have a debt in a domestic currency, you can manage it and pass it through. I'm not saying it's not challenging. But the idea that it's going to blow up and all of that, I think, is a very exaggerated notion. It has to be well managed. and I think it's well managed. And then when you take a longer look, like some of the innovations and the, and the changes that they're making for the productivity of the longer run, it's going to be important. You know, their bad growth rate is, is probably going to be twice our good go growth rate, in right. a sense. So you take a look at where they're going to be. It's going to be, you know, it's a positive outlook. You have a positive outlook, too? I, I remember when you were in that seat as, as the Treasury Secretary, you, you, you had made some comments about some concerns. Oh, yeah, I mean, China's, um, you know, you, uh, you can't, if you talk to them, you'll, you'll see this. You, you can't be more worried about these risks than they are. And they, I think they have an exceptionally good feel for the complexity of the risks they face as they manage through this, you know, very dangerous, uh, messy transition they're going through. And, it, you know, it's going to be messy. It sort of has to be messy in some ways. <laughs> because they're trying to let the market play a greater role and they're trying to introduce right. the possibility of default and they want to have some broader restructuring of the economy. They want to reallocate economic activity. That in some ways has to be a messy process. And there's other things that are going to slow the economy. But they have degrees of freedom that are the envy of the world in how they do this because they have very high savings rate, no meaningful uh, debt in other people's currencies. They have uh, a still a relatively closed capital account. Very, very unlikely they lose control of the exchange rate. And they've got a financial system that is, uh, you know, is fundamentally dominated by the state and dominated by banks. And that's a financial, that's a system that's easier to stabilize and recapitalize and uh, break runs uh, than, you know, for example, just to take a negative example, the system 
we faced in 2007. So they have enviable degrees of freedom, and they are a remarkably talented, experienced group of people, having benefited a lot, not just what they've been through. You know, they did a massive recapitalization of their system, what, 15 years ago or so? Uh, and, yeah, and, they, um, and they're doing one now, too, uh, making some progress on that. But they got to watch all the mistakes and judgments other countries made and try to take the best of that in that period of time. So, uh, you know, it'll be, a, it'll be a challenging thing. As I said, it has to be messy in some ways, but they have, a, they have a, uh, lots of tools to manage this without going through a major uh, a crisis that will be deeply damaging, right. not just to them, but to the rest of the world. Uh, Ray, industry question for, for you. And Tim, by the way, now that you're a capitalist, you can participate in this as well. Um, $22.5 billion uh, in terms of money flows has come into your firm recently. In an environment where the hedge fund business writ large has struggled across the board, as you look out at the business over the next couple of years, what do you see happening? People like Dan Loeb have talked about a washout in this business. Where does it go? Um, I think that the market environment will be always exciting. And the question is whether you're adding value or not. Um, I think most importantly, uh, whether you're going to add value in a bad time. Um, in other words, everybody's long. You know, everybody's almost leveraged long. Right. That's an exposure. So I think that um, it depends how well you play the game, and there'll be opportunities. And the important thing is whether you also make money in the good times when and the bad times when others. Could are. Ray Dalio start Bridgewater today, though? Oh yeah, I think it's two. You know, it was, it was not long. Two thousand seven. The world, 2008, had a, had a bust. Right. We made 14.5% in uh, 2008 when most people didn't. Um, our average returns were... Th the opportunities of volatility are there. There's a cross current right. right now that's going on, right? The cross current is the um, pushing of liquidity and all that liquidity causing asset prices to right. rise and so on. And then there is the low future asset prices and the volatility that lies ahead for the reasons that we're talking about. So we're in the middle of that cross current right there. The currents are going to change. Right. And so I think that there's, you know, if there's boring, then we're in trouble. Um, we have just a couple minutes, and I do want to uh, ask you one question about culture at Bridgewater, only because it's come up in the headlines repeatedly, and I want to ask you about this. Um, FBI Director James Comey worked at Bridgewater. Uh, he was your general counsel. And when he left, he wrote something that I thought was fascinating. He said, I love the idea of our culture of transparency and truth. But he went on to say the logic-based, relentless pursuit of excellence is inconsistent with the time of joy that, an with the, with the time of joy that animates me. And I thought that was so interesting because it sort of captured both sides of this. What do you think it is that's so misunderstood about the culture at Bridgewater? Well, uh, let me describe the Bridgewater culture in uh, one sentence. Uh, it is to have a, a, an idea meritocracy which pursues meaningful work and meaningful relationships through radical truth and radical transparency. So by meaningful work, like are you in a mission and uh, 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 together and what right. that's like. And the meaningful relationships is can we be totally truthful with each other? Like I don't think you're so good at that or you might be wrong. Right or you made mistakes, and can we have that kind of conversation in a radically truthful way? And radical transparency, like we tape everything for everybody to see so that there's no spin. Okay, can you operate in an environment like that so that nothing's hidden? Because that way you'll have a real idea of meritocracy because you won't have an information imbalance. This is an unusual culture because we've sort of kept it behind the scenes, in a sense. It's largely misunderstood. Some people absolutely hate it, and some people could never work anywhere else. So that's by and large what it's like. Fair enough. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, final question for both of you. Um, if it's Thanksgiving and you're invited to dinner at um, what could be President Trump's house uh, for dinner, what would you tell him? I'll let Tim go first. Oh. He's the expert. <laughs> 
No, I, I think I'm going to take refuge seat. in my usual place, which is to not comment on the choices of our successors. That's sort of my, that's the that's little refuge I, li I like. I, I guess I would say just, I would just try to make a virtue of something that I think Ray helped define. It's a good thing, it would be a good thing for us to, to uh, value as a country, which is, you know, you want people to be able to take some time and try to look at the long arc of challenge ahead of us and trying to think about strategy to help better position to deal with those things and try to take that long view so that as you go into the politics and the messy, ugly, terrible politics uh, that constrain those choices, you've got to view at least an idea of what we need to be trying to do for the economy long term. And, you know, as a country in history, we were really excellent at the really important moments at doing that. And that's the, really the most important thing. And I think what uh, that, that ability to sort of go deeper and try to understand the forces shaping the quality of, of opportunity people have in this country and how we can better address those, what they're going to do, that takes a, a lot of care and thought. And it has to be done in that quiet moment uh, where you can push the politics away. And whoever's in any of those jobs, you want them to, uh, I don't know if that's Comey's joy. There may not be that much joy in it, but they should try to figure out a way to find that space to think about that early before they get overwhelmed right. uh, by the constraints. Tim's advice, I think, is uh, good advice. Like, calm down and make sure you understand how the economic machine works. You know, be open-minded. Uh, I think what scares Tim and I the most about uh, the populism uh, is that that's that extreme ism. We don't want extremism. We don't want rush. We want uh, to be able to understand that things are complicated. And right. I thought your answer might be to meditate. Um, I want to thank <laughs> both too, of these yeah. gentlemen for a great conversation. Ray Dalio, Tim Geithner. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.